via telephone in this country, the amazing financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the various group of financial advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, Robin Bill. How are you guys? Good morning, Phil. Hey, you're probably the second most visible member of your family. I look at the newspaper and I see a picture of your daughter all the time. <laughs> yeah, she gets uh, she gets some attention for uh, for volleyball, and I think she's a little bit better looking than I am too. So, so good for her. She's having a, a fun senior year, and I didn't know that she she was in the paper though. So I have to go yeah. talk to go check it out. Yeah, uh, at least once uh, uh, recently, maybe two weeks or so ago, playing volleyball. Yeah, we'll have to go check it out. But yeah, she uh, they they do a good job of coverage with uh, girls volleyball. So it's uh, good good to hear that. I'll have to go check that out. I had a good weekend myself here, Phil, with my teams. My high school team won Friday night. Pitt, my college team, beat WVU Saturday. I can hear everybody right now. <laughs> they turn you off. They they're turning us off, Rob. They're gone. They're, we've they're lost the audience. Canceled, Rob. Uh, and then the Steelers won on uh, Sunday. So that was a, I had a three for three weekend. Yes, it was it was a good weekend for me. I was only focused on the Steelers and, of course, the Ravens and the Bengals. And I kind of rubbed it in Dylan's face a little bit. My apologies, Dylan. But no, uh, you know, you're not Steelers sorry, are... Phil. You you took great <laughs> great pleasure in that. <laughs> but the Steelers are up two games on both of those guys, so we'll take it. Not not impressive offensively, but you can't be better than two and zero right now. I think the Steelers are the only team in the NFL uh, in the history of the NFL the first two weeks to win games without getting a first down on offense in either game. <laughs> don't need it they can't score they can't win just just seems that way uh but but dylan uh you know i take a lot of grief around here from you ravens fans you and berzellini over there and uh, from colin who as he knowing that i'm a pit fan he keeps telling me to eat something i don't know what he i can never understand the rest of that su- that sentence that he's trying to tell me uh, well i'm not going to clear it up now <laughs> but uh i take i i deal with it silently around here i'm the old guy around the community <laughs> these young guys have lots of energy bill uh, but uh, but you know, hey, what you I tell did, you, what? you did say silently. Did oh, silent, you? I deal with it silently. I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just good point, Bill. It, it's Neil Brown, even John Harbaugh now for me. It's just, I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure about either one. There's one of the two. I'm definitely not sure of at all. But the other one, I'm starting to ask questions. Here's here's the great thing uh, that should be discussed and isn't. So WVU. First off, kudos to them for scheduling out of conference with Penn State and Pitt because too many schools of WVU's size and stature schedule three Albany's in a row. You, you need one Albany, you do. If you're if you're WVU or if you're Pitt, I think they played Kent State or whomever uh, before they played Cincinnati. And if you're a big school, you need one of those games. But too many schools play three of those games, and then. There should be a conference that consists of Pitt, Penn State, and West Virginia. The fact that college football is in its current status, where teams that are so close and are natural rivals and recruit the same grounds don't play each other in a conference regularly, is a shame. The old Big East, they did just that. They did, but Penn State was never in the Big East. And it was the Big East basketball schools the five basketball playing schools of the Big East, which voted no on Penn State, what really started this mess, because that drove Penn State to the Big Ten, and that was the beginning of the super conferences. Not exactly that day, but that started it. When Penn State went to the Big Ten, it tilted the college football world, and now it's basically an arms race to create conferences. And I know that the the PAC... Uh, whatever the number is going to be. It used to be the Pac-8 when I was a kid, then it became the Pac-10, the Pac-12. You know, they kind of collapsed, and now they're bringing in the Mountain West. And and they look a lot like what the Big East looked like when the Big East started to lose schools. They started thinking about bringing in schools that you're like, what? First off, it's not in the East. And, and secondly, that's not really a football school. And, and the, that's what the Pac-8, 10, or 12, whatever it's going to call itself, is going to – wind up looking like once they start bringing in what is it dylan middle tennessee state at some point is going to, is going to be in the, uh i know in the it was Pac-12. what Fre- fresno state and colorado state and i think san diego state and all those uh i think it's at six right now so the yeah. six pack right the six pack would be a good name for the conference but at this college football is is in a ridiculous state right now where you you don't have 
Pitt, Penn State, and West Virginia should be in the same conference. Boston College, Syracuse, these Eastern schools should be in the same conference. And it's very quickly evolving down to two mega conferences. It really is. SEC and the Big Ten. It really is. And everybody else is just going to kind of fold in with them. So, uh, Phil, uh, enough about that. Uh, We were promised a discussion on annuities this week. Yes, we were. And and you said you'd need hours to actually explain annuities. (laughs) But you're going to have to do it in 18 well, minutes. I've got 18 minutes. And, and of course, we, we can't dive into all the annuities are in 18 minutes. But it's a, an ex- extremely hot topic for a lot of investors. So I'm going to start with the tax status of annuities. And I, in my opinion, most likely the biggest danger that annuities provide. So to be clear, annuities do have a place in some people's portfolios not everyone's it's not a, it's not a cure-all for every financial uh, disease that you could have but it does have its place but where we see and this is where i'd like to start where we see in our office the biggest tragedies if you will with annuities is on the tax front so before i get into that you need to know that there's a major difference in how assets are taxed based off of what you did when you put them in a certain account. So, of course, we excuse me, know, ex- excuse me, Phil, before we get started, what is an annuity? I want to go to basic definition. It, what is an annuity? An annuity is an insurance against living too long. It's the exact opposite of life insurance. Life insurance is insurance against passing before you, you anticipated and in and, and its truest sense of the word. Now, there's other reasons to have life insurance, but an annuity in its truest sense of the word is an insurance against living too long, provide a lifelong income stream that would never run out. That's its initial purpose, regardless of how long you live. Our biggest fear in retirement is that we outlive our money and we come along and say, hey, this annuity can ensure that you have a stream of income, much like Social Security or or pension would do, uh, to protect you against inflation. If you live to be 105, you still got an income stream. So, but in that, you also have, and everybody talks about the fees, and of course they are expensive because they're providing an insurance. They, they're taking a risk that someone could live too long and I'd have to pay you too long of a time frame. You would outlive your life expectancy, so therefore there's a cost to us. And there go the high expenses that, that come with them. But in our estimation, that's not the biggest issue with annuities. So if we rewind about 25 years ago, as John reminded me this morning, there used to be a major difference in, or not a major difference, in ordinary income tax and capital gain tax. So before uh, uh, year 2000, I think it was year 2000, 2001, there was a change to capital gain taxes, which is the taxes that you pay on non-qualified assets. Let's just assume, and we'll use 100,000, that someone has saved a hundred thousand that's sitting in their bank account and that that money is non qualified. You've made no arrangements with the IRS for that money. Sitting there, you pay tax as you go, opposed to a four oh one K IRA or even a Roth account where there is a deal made where I say, Hey, I'm not going to pay tax on it now, I'll pay tax on it later. So the way a non qualified asset is taxed the gain is taxed in most cases, unless it's interest, as a long-term capital gain, whereas an IRA, a 401k traditional, not Roth, but traditional IRA 401k is taxed as ordinary income, the same as your paycheck. In today's world, there's a major difference in those two taxes. With a non-qualified asset, a long-term capital gain for the majority of people, the vast majority of people, caps out at 15 percent some do fall into the 20 percent range but ordinary income tax goes way up into the high 30s uh, for for some but for most of us 12 22 or 24 percent on ordinary income tax so here goes the problem with annuities as we see them the biggest problem and this is just scratching the surface but when people take non-qualified assets that are subject to capital gain taxes that maxes out at 15 percent, number one, are also uh, privileged to step up in cost basis at death. So if you're passing it to an heir, to, to your children, they would get a step up in cost basis and reduce or eliminate any taxes on it whatsoever. 
when you enter into an annuity, when you place that hundred thousand or whatever dollar amount that you that that you would like to to place into an annuity on a non-qualified basis, you give up the ability to have it taxed as long-term capital gain. Any growth on that annuity from that point forward is now taxed as ordinary income, not just to you, but whoever may inherit those assets. So we see that often where people will come in and say, hey, I got a guarantee interest rate or what, what, whatever it may be of 4 or 5 percent, and that's why I put it into this annuity without knowing that that 4 or 5 percent is now going to be taxed as ordinary income opposed to, to long-term capital gain. And even worse, in a lot of those cases, we find out that that client wouldn't even be subject to long-term capital gain taxes um, if, if it remained in a, in a basic non-qualified account and they just said, hey, I'm going to invest it in a mutual fund or exchange-traded fund or individual stocks or whatever it may be, that growth would very likely had been completely tax-free had it stayed in that environment, but instead they were sold a product in an annuity. And then we dig even deeper to find out, you know, this client has a pension, this client has Social Security, and then the next issue with annuities is liquidity, and, the, and they don't have a lot of liquidity outside of that annuity. And what I mean by liquidity is I can go in and get as much or as little at any point in time that I want and an annuity doesn't allow you to do that because of surrender charges. So we remember back to what we had said, these annuities are taking a risk. And the risk is that you live too long. So ensure that they don't lose money. They, you have to keep that annuity in there for what is referred to as a surrender period. You can't change your mind before that surrender period is over. And then even when it's over, you have taxes to deal with. Hopefully, if it had grown, you have ordinary income taxes to deal with. But that liquidity issue that we see, we see people walking in and say, hey, I need to buy a car, I need to get my roof fixed, or I need to, in, in the tragic case that's sticking out in my mind, I need to support my daughter because my grandson has a major illness and she's no, unable to work and she spends all of her time at the hospital. I need to pull my money out of my bank. But they told me I couldn't do that without a penalty. What is going on? And he didn't realize that he'd gone into an annuity. So the second issue with annuities is liquidity. So if you can't go in and get what you want, when you want, we see that as a problem. And the investor needs to know that they can't necessarily go in and get what they want, when they want, because of surrender charges. And, by the way, if it goes into an annuity, you should be purchasing that for the income stream, for the lifelong or predetermined period income stream that it's going to provide you. If you exceed what that income stream is, you've now broken that agreement and it no longer exists. You can no longer uh, go uh, get that stream of income for the rest of your life. So it's very inhibitive of what you can do with those funds. So liquidity is the next issue. So after bringing up those two issues, in my opinion, the biggest one is the change in tax status. And going back, if you had an annuity that you bought in 1995, don't go kill the friendly guy that sold it to you because tax rates were different and that wasn't a big deal prior to the tax changes in 2000 or 2001 but there are places where annuity makes sense so if you have an annuity i don't want you to sit there and think man that wasn't right for me and i shouldn't have purchased that they do make sense in a lot of cases and i can't go through all the cases in i've got nine minutes remaining i can't go through all the scenarios in which it would work but in most cases in today's world, it makes most sense on already tax-deferred assets. So in an IRA or what used to be a 401K, if you said, you know what, I've got plenty of liquidity outside of the annuity to handle emergencies or vacations or huge expenses that I may have throughout the year, I just need a set amount of money for the rest of my life to, to supplement Social Security and if I have a pension as well – to supplement that, to make sure that my essentials are covered, that's when the annuity makes sense, assuming that the taxes are already deferred and it's already subject anyway to ordinary income tax, that, assuming that, and assuming that you have liquidity outside, that's where they make sense. 
because you're not going to need the money that's inside of that annuity. But annuities are extremely complex, extremely complex. And we find that they're used as a solution in extremely simple problems where I'm just looking for a guaranteed rate of return or a better interest rate on on my pile of money sitting inside of a bank. And that's a really simple uh, solution. But what we do is, or what has what is done quite often, are there, these investors are placed in these very, very complex and complicated products that, in my opinion, should you should have more education in order to place these annuities. There should be more background. If you've ever had an annuity placed, especially an after-tax or a non-qualified annuity, if you've ever had one placed without that person looking at your tax situation and asking your liquidity needs and really digging into your liquidity needs, then it was very likely that it was placed without the knowledge that you they should have had in order to place that annuity. Now, there's a lot of compliance on annuities. Now, I know for us at Ameriprise, we have to jump through a lot of hoops in order to place an annuity. We have to uh, ensure that there's liquidity there, that we're not changing the tax status in, in a negative way on a non-qualified side. Uh, we have to ensure that they do need a stream of income for the rest of their life. And here brings up another thing that we have seen a, a time or two, where someone that would expect that they wouldn't have a long life expectancy is going into an annuity. Well, if you're 75 years old and you've dealt with heart issues multiple, multiple times, why in the world would you place all of your asset in an annuity that would ensure you against living too long? It's a morbid statement, but it's a statement that needed to be made in that circumstance. Your problem isn't that you're going to live too long. Your problem is is your health and probably health expenses that's going to come up in the near future, and you just placed all of your money inside of an annuity that restricts how much you can pull from it and changes the tax status from it as well in some cases in a non-qualified case. So there, there's the kind of the bugaboos with annuities where we see that there's a problem, not to say that they don't have their place because they do absolutely have their place, but it's almost like garlic. Garlic on, on my garlic bread with spaghetti, that's a good place for it. But as John said, putting it on my Rice Krispies, it doesn't belong and you should never do it. Phil, let's not be discussing Italian food right now. You're going to make me hungry. <laughs> hey, a couple, <laughs> early for garlic. a couple of things. I got... Um, being is that I passed the age 60 marker, I get plenty of mailers inviting me to a free dinner at a very nice restaurant to discuss retirement. And these are always about annuities. I haven't attended one, but when you read uh, who they're sponsored by or whatever, uh, it usually has to do with an insurance company and an, an annuity. Uh, and when I was uh, right out of college, I had an insurance license and we were able to sell annuities, not investments, uh, but yeah. Annuities and and people loved to sell annuities because the commission was pretty good on an annuity. Yeah. So uh, it, it it begs the question: Is the person trying to sell me an annuity, trying to sell it to me because it's the best thing that I could do, or are they trying to sell it to me because it's the best commission that they can get? No, and that's, they, they are high in commissions, and you can select to have those commissions spread out over time instead of all up front. And, and actually, you end up getting a you get a you get about the same amount of money, but it's spread out over time. And now your goal as a as a financial advisor or a fiduciary for that client is, I want to hand deliver the investments and, and and see this through, not just day one where I get it all up front. But and, and that brings up another good point: insurance uh, annuities can be sold by someone with only an insurance license. Now, that's not to say that someone with an insurance license doesn't know enough to sell an annuity. A lot of them out there are great, and they do the right things by their clients. But you have to have a securities license to sell a variable annuity. Now, a fixed annuity is just a just what it says. It's fixed. We're going to pay you this rate of return uh, over the life of the annuity. It's guaranteed. But, of course, you pay for those guaranteed. You have to have a securities license to sell a variable annuity, which really looks a lot like any other investment account. It's just full of sub-accounts, which are filled with mutual funds or the like. So it's a, it does have some variability to it. It goes up and down in value and or it goes up and down in payout amounts 
based off what those sub accounts say. So there's two different types. There's a fixed annuity, which insurance you, you, it does not require a securities license, and also variable annuities that does require an insurance license. John and I have spoke about this multiple times. In our opinion, to place an annuity, we think that you should have some further training. Whether it's if you're just if you just have your insurance license or you have them both, uh, we we believe that you should have some further fiduciary training because you really have to dig deep into these to make sure that they're appropriate for the client that's buying them, not just whether or not the interest rate is good or bad or whether investments are suitable. Uh, there's a difference in, in, in suitable investments and what is right for that client. And But you're, you're absolutely correct. They do come with a high cost. And, again, to us, that's not the biggest issue. It's the, the, the tax issue as well as, the uh, the liquidity issue that people uh, don't don't always understand that's the bigger issues they cost what they cost and you pay what you pay for them at the end of the day um, but yes they are very high cost not just in commission but remember you're also paying insurance premiums and then and then there's tons of bells and whistles that you can get with annuities oh they have a death benefit or an enhanced death benefit or they have a guarantee. Uh, uh, rate of return for the first 10 years for all each and every bell and whistle some of them have some long-term care protection for each and every bell and whistle that you have inside of an annuity there's a cost associated with that that with that that you're paying that ultimately is going to subtract from any guarantees that you would get on the on the on the cash amount of that annuity about a minute left, Bill. Did you have a final question for Phil? Uh, maybe not a question as much as a comment. Uh, Phil, I've long been confused about annuities. I'm even more confused now. Congratulations. Well, I, did <laughs> I did not complete my goal. I didn't want to add confusion. But they are very confusing because yeah. there's so many different types. You have fixed and variable annuities. You have non-qualified annuities, and you have IRA annuities or even Roth annuities, and then there's the, all of the underliers underneath of it, the bells and whistles of such, and then what happens if I annuitize it and what if I don't annuitize it. They are very, very complicated uh, vehicles that sometimes are used for very simple solutions. So that uh, you, you're, you're right. Most people are confused about them. I hope I didn't insert more confusion to some of our listeners because I know there was a handful that really wanted to talk about annuities. And we can't really do uh, annuities justice in 20 minutes, but I wanted to focus on you know, some, of the, some of the pushback you get with annuities from our standpoint as fiduciaries and, financial, and certified financial planners, those top two, the tax status changes because of the tax law changes in 2001, and the liquidity issue. Yeah, I think what you did today, Phil, was a uh, word of caution, and, and I think that's very important. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys.